My name is Paul Conway and I serve as the co-chair of the Global Summit on Kidney Disease Innovations. And right now we have a special uh, presentation and a very honored guest uh, with us. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Osterholm. And Dr. Osterholm is a Regents Professor and a McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. And he is also the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. You may know him better over the past several years as one of the experts that's been on many different news channels trying to decipher the signals of COVID and the practical issues facing patients and policymakers. But one of the reasons we're very interested in having Dr. Osterholm with us today is because of his clarity that he brings to issues and the great deal of empathy he has for patients and for caregivers who are often uh, perhaps maybe looked over in some of the discussions that happen on some of the larger issues involving COVID. Uh, Dr. Osterholm, it's an honor to have you and um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, start a chat with you. And maybe if you could start by give us a sense of where we are right now uh, with COVID and the pandemic. Well, first of all, let me just uh, say thank you very much for having me uh, and for in particular this audience. I want to just emphasize uh, we know how much you have had to suffer, not just in terms of physical pain, uh, illness and death, but also just the psychological stress that COVID has placed on your everyday life about what you can and can't do or should or shouldn't do, what you must or can't do at all. And so I, I just want to acknowledge that right up front. Uh, for those of you who have had COVID and survived and are now suffering long COVID effects, uh, also uh, our thoughts go with you too. And hopefully the information we can collect over the next few months uh, given a certain number of studies being done, will be helpful in trying to address long COVID challenges. Uh, you know, one of the things, Paul, that I have uh, clearly tried to articulate is what I know and what I don't know. And while I've been studying pandemics for 40 some years and came into this pandemic uh, realizing there were a lot of unknowns, I had no idea how many unknowns there would be. And so my most famous three words that I have and the words that have served me well is I don't know. But this is what I do know. Uh, we are really in a very different stage of this pandemic right now with this Omicron subvariance BA4, BA5, particularly BA5. We're in an unprecedented time in the United States. We have been what I call on the high plateau for 12 weeks, meaning that if you look across the country for almost all the 50 states, you'll see these elevated levels of activity uh, with serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths really being stable, but stable at a high level. I think most of you would be surprised to know today that with the 450 to 500 deaths a day that we continue to experience day after day after day after day makes COVID the number four leading cause of death in the country right now. And uh, this is very different than the big mountain peaks of cases, the big surges we saw with Alpha, Delta, in the early days of Omicron, and then the big uh, valleys where for a period of time, people would say, ah, it's all over with, it's done. We don't know where we're at. We don't know what the next virus uh, strain will look like. Will it be uh, another subvariant of Omicron? Will it be Pi or Sigma? Will it evade immune protection? Will it in fact uh, cause more serious illness? We don't know. So I think suffice it to say in the United States right now, we still have real challenges with this virus. Let me just add one caveat to that. And it's also uh, part of the reason why I say I don't know. If you look in Europe in particular, they saw the very big peak of cases associated both with Omicron, BA1, and then again earlier this summer with BA5. But those case numbers have come down dramatically. They're not on a high plateau, rather they're on a, a, the same mountain peak valley kind of picture. On the other hand, if you go to Asia, uh, and particularly Southeast Asia and you know, Oceania, you'll see that in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the highest rates of infection, the highest rates of serious illness and deaths are occurring and have occurred over the past two months with BA5. You know, it was just a year ago, people would say to me, we gotta do it like New Zealand, look how good they are. New Zealand just recently reported out the highest incidence of deaths due to COVID of any country in the world at any time during the pandemic. So it gives you a sense that we do have some real challenges yet. So I don't know where it's gonna go, but I can tell you one thing, uh, as much as we as a country are done with this virus, this virus is not done with us. You know, and I tell you what, Doc, this, this is the clarity that we like because I think you're 
putting a laser on the tempo that the country's kind of in right now are thinking, you know, maybe we've moved beyond it or maybe there's been a soft landing. But one of the things that you've been very clear about in addressing are the concerns of those who are immunocompromised uh, and immunosuppressed. So organ transplant patients, those who are undergoing dialysis, and as particularly for the kidney population, uh, many different cofactors that come along with kidney disease. And so what I wanted to ask you is given the backdrop that you just painted, uh, our patients uh, are across the world uh, do a very good job of uh, arming themselves with the tools they need to stay safe. But in the midst of this, uh, what's one of the top line messages that you would give to folks as they're hearing the outside chatter, but for their particular population or their particular condition, uh, what do you think they ought to be doing right now uh, personally? Well, the most important message I can send out today is we've got to learn to live with this virus. It's here. And that means we can't be afraid to be alive. Yet we have to be respectful of what the virus can and will do. So number one, have all the doses of vaccine you're eligible for. Many of you will be eligible for five doses, some for four. Get all of them because the data is really compelling that while the vaccine will not necessarily stop you from getting infected or from even becoming clinically ill and transmitting the virus, um, it has a tremendous impact on protecting you against severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. And I think that by itself is a, a priceless gift that these vaccines give us. Now, the other thing you can do is, of course, protect your air, meaning that you want the air that you breathe into your lungs to be free of virus. And I must tell you that we really have not fully appreciated just how effective N95 respirators, which to many will seem uncomfortable and in some cases just not worth it. But, you know, you can go in public places. Now, you can't eat in a restaurant like that unless you're outdoors, uh, but you can do that. You know, over the 4th of July, I took a trip from Minneapolis, drove out to uh, Tanglewood and the Berkshires, uh, sat in the fifth row, and watched the James Taylor July 4th concert with so much uh, enthusiasm, I had tears running down my cheeks. But I had, and my partner, and she too, had our N95s on when we went into hotels, we went to uh, gas stations, we ate our meals outside, we were at the outdoor concert with our N95s. And, you know, as an older man, I'm too at risk. And, you know, I felt very protected at that point. So I don't want you to feel like you can't live your life, but getting vaccinated and also using your respirator. Now, for some of you, you will be also eligible for Evershield, the monoclonal antibody that can be given that can provide protection for weeks to months after it's been uh, given. And it's one that so far still is being quite effective, even against the variants we've seen. So I think the message is don't let this virus kill you while you're alive because you can't live the life that is one without loneliness. At the same time, you don't want to live a life where the virus does kill you. And so from that perspective, I think just simple common steps of vaccine, respiratory protection, using uh, the Evershield. And then if you do become clinically ill, do take Paxlovid. That I think as a drug has received some bad press lately about rebounds. We now have data supporting the fact that rebounds occur whether you take Paxlovid or not. And these may not be Paxlovid associated, but I can tell you the data are clear and compelling with Paxlovid that in fact, again, it helps reduce serious illness, hospitalizations and deaths. So you can't be afraid to live your lives. You have to live them, but we need to live them as safely as we possibly can. And, and I tell you what, that's that's a great point because uh, I think a lot of uh, patients, myself included, we get to the point where you're a little bit stir crazy, and uh, you're experts on how to do things online and major events and things like that. But at a certain point, you want to get out and uh, know that there are tools out there that we can keep using to stay engaged. Let me ask you this: given your expertise in the field of public health, uh, we're very focused on innovation and what has occurred. But I'm interested in your background. Uh, what is your sense? Is there an untold story about the speed and expertise that has been brought to bear to create therapeutics and innovations in this space that maybe people don't appreciate uh, right now or haven't focused on? That's a story that uh, should be celebrated by patients and uh, by yeah. industry policymakers? Well, you know, I think this uh, story is a complicated one at the very least. Um, and one that we have to have, I think, real honesty in terms of what we've done and not done, only because that then serves as the roadmap for where we need to go. For example, 
you know, the mRNA technology, the way we made these new vaccines, and along with the vaccine vectors, uh, the adenovector vaccines, were seen as not only innovative, but actually tremendously important in saving lives early on in the pandemic. And they have saved many, many, many lives. But you may recall in the early days, there was this unbridled enthusiasm that said, ha ha, these vaccines will stop you from getting infected. They'll stop you from transmitting the virus. And oh, by the way, then you, therefore you won't die or get seriously ill. Well, over time, we came to realize that in fact, these vaccines didn't just do that that the number of people who would ultimately get infected with waning immunity or the virus itself would change to become more transmissible or evade the immune protection um, actually became a reality. And while that did not keep the vaccines from still you know, providing the protection against serious illness, hospitalizations and deaths, it pointed out we need new and better vaccines. Today in this country, getting a booster is really critical. I, for example, feel uh, let, let, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the CDC's definition of fully vaccinated as two doses. It should be the doses you're eligible to receive, four or five. And we need to have people get those because we know with each successive one, you have more protection. But we can't boost our way out of this pandemic. Our group right now is leading an international effort uh, to develop a roadmap for even new and better uh, COVID vaccines that can provide more durable immunity and protection. So I think we still have some real challenges there. I wish we had more therapeutic agents. Uh, I think, you know, I mentioned Paxlovid. Uh, there are several other drugs that are there. I do worry as an infectious disease epidemiologist about resistance occurring, what might happen with that over time, as we've seen with all the other antivirals that we have. So I think we still have some real challenges yet, but we're up to it. And I think now is the time to continue to invest, not rest on our laurels, and to say innovation is just starting, it's not done. So you, you brought up a good point on roadmaps. Our, our audience is very familiar with roadmaps for innovation for artificial uh, wearable and artificial implant organs and for new technologies and dialysis. But one of the things I'm interested in is your take on What's the most effective way, do you think, in the midst of COVID for patient advocates and advocates organizations to constructively engage with public health experts like yourself and others that are involved in trying to come up with solutions? Um, what, what do you think is the best way that we could contribute to uh, the types of work that you do and that others are doing around the country? Well, I would say without any doubt whatsoever, you have to have your loud voice present. And loud doesn't mean shouting. Loud means you're heard. And I think that that's a very important point. You know, far too many times in this business, uh, forget that there really are people who are patients. We forget that when someone dies, that impacts an entire family, an entire community. Uh, and, and so I think the human side of all of this can never ever be lost. That is compelling. So don't lose that voice because you are the human side of this. This is real. This is not an abstract event for you. This is life and death day after day after day. So I think having that voice is very important. I think the second thing is just objectively, and I believe uh, with you know the kind of criteria you can understand, hold us all accountable. You know, I feel accountable every day. When I say I don't know, I feel I have an obligation to figure out though what I can tell you and what I need to do to get the information so I can say I do know. And I think you should hold us all accountable for that. And most of all, feel empowered. Don't feel as if somehow this virus is taking your life away from you, even the life you live, not just the life that may be of illness. And, and make certain that the things you do are as support to your friends, colleagues, to those individuals who are suffering from many of the same challenges that you are. And you know, the last piece I would say, and I do a weekly podcast now, it's every other week uh, about COVID. And I think the one thing that has been most uh, illustrative to me about the impact of this podcast is, you know, it's for me myself, the only way I get through this is realize the importance of kindness and the fact that in the big picture of things, all these tragedies, all these challenges can surely be impacted by a pandemic of kindness. And I know this may sound somewhat uh, uh, not in keeping with a scientific message, but I think one of the ways we as a scientific community, as a patient community, will get through this is through the ability to share kindness as well as uh, have that loud voice. 
<laughs> you know, Doc, uh, this is why we wanted to invite you because you have a ability to speak clearly and uh, in very sharp terms about things that don't cost anything, such as kindness and decency and empathy for others. And we deeply appreciate it. One final question for you, Doc. Uh, one of the uh, communities that's often overlooked, and we know this well as kidney patients, and you probably know it well as a public health professional, is a, a final message, and this is the final question to you. Um, for those who are caregivers, whether they're families or professionals that are working with kidney patients through this, uh, what would you say to them as you look to the fall and, and beyond? Thank God you're there. Thank God. That's all I can say. I think, you know, uh, in the first year of the pandemic, I helped start a foundation uh, that was to help support families of healthcare workers who died uh, largely from their exposure on the job. And I saw the pain and suffering that occurred in that group. And yet they continued to come back to work day after day. They continued to work under incredibly difficult conditions. Um, you know, the uh, caregivers you're talking about here are real heroes. They are the heroes. They are the front line. And I think our support for them can never be overstated or uh, underestimated. And so all I would say is, is that, you know, thank you. Thank you. We will continue to do what we can to make your jobs easier, which I hope will then make your lives easier. But, uh, you know, in the big picture of life, all I can say is people such as the caregivers we're talking about here, who are from my perspective are the real heroes that I look up to. Well, I tell you what, Doc, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've been very generous to us. Thank and you. Uh, again, I can't say it enough, candor and clarity uh, has been important for all of us and uh, you've been a champion of that.